So actually, when you teach, you retain 90% of all that you teach. Uh, when you're just listening, you only retain 5% of it. So that's, I, what do you do? What do you do with that, right? You have to make everybody teach. Everybody's got to teach, right? Everybody's got to learn it to where they're able to teach the thing. Um, I'm also seeing the more I repeat the powers of the federal and the state government, the more that I memorize them. So I'm just going to repeat them again because I want to memorize them. So the express powers of the federal government, these are the, the powers of the federal government that is explicitly stated in the U.S. Constitution, right? So the federal government, the United States uh, of America is allowed to print money. They're allowed to regulate interstate and international trade, make treaties, conduct foreign policy, declare war, provide army, provide a navy, establish post offices, make laws necessary and proper to carry out those powers, right? So print money, bills and coins, regulate it, enter into treaties with foreign governments, regulate commerce between the states and internationally, declare war, establish army, navy, post offices, uh, establish the postage, and then make the laws necessary in order to enforce all of those express powers. The powers of the state government, because the state powers uh, comes from the Tenth Amendment, which says that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So therefore, if the state doesn't prohibit it and it's not delegated specifically by the U.S., then that means the states and the people get to uh, declare what they want, how they want their rules and their laws to operate. The powers of the state government, they can issue licenses, hunter uh, hunting licenses, driver's licenses, fishing licenses, marriage licenses. They can regulate intrastate commerce, so within the state conduct elections, right? So Allison, Lundergan, Grimes, um, the county clerks, they get to um, conduct the elections. It's the local people who conduct the elections, establish local governments. All the power of the cities and the counties come from Frankfurt, ratify amendments to constitutions. So if we wanted to pass an amendment, there's the gay amendment, right? Uh, Bush wanted to get some, the uh, have a greater turnout rate, get all the gay bashers, all the homophobes. So in 2003 or 2004, um, the Kentucky actually 75% of well overwhelming uh, amount of people passed the amendment to um, only uh, allow men and women to marry each other. Which is, you know, that's incredible because the, basically, what, 75%, that's like the vast majority of Kentuckians are homophobic people. Um, even though recently they had some sort of federal injunction. And actually, that's a, that's a good, um, I should mention that. I should actually check it out. Because uh, for sheer, there is a, they have to respect the other laws of the other states. So the, uh, a federal judge had said that Kentucky could legalize or recognize marriages because it was uh, recognized in other states. But you got Steve Brashear who's trying to fight it. So that's um, uh, a good reference for, you know, something else, uh, uh, for um, something to look up for me just to talk about later. So the powers of the state government, right, they can regulate interstate businesses, conduct elections, take measures for public health and safety. They exert powers. Uh, the Constitution doesn't actually state the uh, prohibit the states from using exclusive powers of state governments. I don't know. So, ratified amendments to the Constitution provide for the public health and the safety exercise powers not delegated, so, such as legal drinking and smoking ages. They can pass laws that, seatbelt laws, they can pass um, prohibition laws, they can stop legal drinking and smoking ages. Or not stop it, but uh, uh, regulate, say what age a person can smoke, say what age a person can drink. So that's the powers of the state government. Issue licenses, regulate interstate businesses, conduct elections, establish local governments, ratify amendments to the Constitution, take measures for public health and safety. That's, um, that's the powers of the state government. And then we're going to get to the current powers and then the, the denied powers, and then we're finished. Um, maybe it might take the next one. Okay. So right now I want to finish up about the implied powers. So these were the express powers that we had the, with the federal government to print money, to regulate interstate trade, make treaties, declare war, provide army, navy, uh, post office. But an implied power says it's an elasticity. It kind of stretches the powers that the federal government have. And the way that they stretch the powers is, first of all, in order to enforce those express powers, they have to have the ability to do so, right? That's kind of 
clear. That's kind of logical. That makes sense. Now, the ones that don't make sense are where Hamilton noted that the general welfare clause and the necessary and proper clause gave elasticity to the Constitution. So, while these are the express powers that the Constitution can handle because the government is there to protect the general welfare of the people, um, in order to, to protect the general welfare, that can mean anything, right? The general welfare of the people to be protected, therefore I need to pass Obamacare. The general welfare of the people need to be protected, therefore I'm going to fire a bunch of air traffic controllers. You know, whatever it is that they think it is. And then the necessary and proper clause and um, the commerce clause. So those are the three things that increase the scope, the implied powers, the incidental powers, the elasticity of the Constitution. So you got your express powers, right, that says these are the things you can do. And then these other ones, which we can fill in with whatever we want to fill in. So the, um, let's go with the General Commerce Clause, or the General Welfare Clause. So it's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, known as the Tax and Spend Clause. It's a clause that gives the federal government its power of taxation. Component parts of this clause are known as the General Welfare Clause and the uniformity clause. The, the text, it reads, the, uh, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, but all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. So if there is a, you know, a uniform, it's just saying that if, if they do put a tax out, then it has to be uniform with everybody, a flat tax, right? Which should be, I don't know, it seems like that's, a, it's the Constitution, right? It's in, it's in Article um, 1, Section 8, Clause 1 in the Constitution to have some sort of flat tax. But anyways, repeat again, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. So they're allowed to tax people in order to provide for the common defense, right? So for military, you can tax the people in order for military and for the general welfare of the United States. So that's everything. That is everything. That's, you can have collect taxes for the military. You can collect taxes for the general welfare, such as Obamacare, such as Social Security, such as Medicare, the general welfare of the people shall be protected. That's what uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, 181, right? And it's, as, it's the general welfare clause, but it's also it's mainly the tax and spending clause. They're allowed to tax people in order for the general welfare, which is very vague, but the general welfare clause, since that is part of it, then that is saying that that is a responsibility. That is what Alexander Hamilton was saying. Um, he's saying that the general welfare of the United States is what the government needs to protect. So therefore, if anything can fall under the general welfare clause, then it's perfectly fine and acceptable. That's uh, the general welfare clause. Then you have the necessary and proper clause, which is known as the elastic clause, the basket clause, coefficient clause, and the sweeping clause. This is all from Wikipedia, which... I hate Wikipedia. I'm going to start getting away from it. Um, but it's a provision in Article 1 of the United States Constitution located in Section 8, Clause 18. Okay, so Section 8 of the Constitution, Clause 18, is the necessary and proper clause. The text of it reads as such. The Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or any department or officer thereof. It's incredible, actually. The Constitution is actually a fairly short document, but it's like these small little phrases that are, you know, it's tucked in this, this uh, proper necessary and proper clause is tucked in Clause 18, Section 8, Clause 18. Right? So, you know, you pass seven sections up, right? It wasn't in the first section, second section, but it's section eight. And clause 18, right? So it's the 18th one down. Um, so when people write the Constitution, man, you got to look at each and every line, each and every single sentence. Because people will try to slip in some single sentence that will just completely change the entire, you know, what, what the essence of the document is. So... These are the implied powers, so this is how the government tries to expand its powers, and they're expanding their powers because they're saying, you know, here's the, here's the text, right? 
the Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or any department or officer thereof. So in order to enforce the express powers you're allowed to have, you know, the, the Bank of the United States is a, is a good example of this because the Bank of the United States, we, it doesn't specifically, it, it does not expressly state that we need a Federal Reserve. But it does expressly state that the U.S. government has the ability to coin, um, to coin money and to put out paper money and to regulate that coining and uh, the paper money that's, that they print up. So the Federal Reserve prints up a bunch of money whenever they feel like it, inflates the currency, but we're the standard bearer, you know, all around. We're the medium of exchange. So everybody's dependent on the dollar, but it doesn't look good for everybody when you just print up a bunch of money um, in order to cover up your debts. The, um, but it says, you know, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. So, which is necessary and proper. Anything that's necessary and proper, how are you going to coin money? How are you going to uh, regulate the money? Well, we're going to establish a bank in the United States. That's how we're going to do it. Right? So, let's see, let's, let's see what they wrote about here. The, dra the draft necessary and proper clause provoked controversy during dis discussions of the proposed Constitution and its inclusion became a focal point of criticism for those opposed to the Constitution's ratification. The Anti-Federalists expressed concern that the clause would grant the federal government boundless power because what is necessary and proper, whatever I think is necessary and proper, right? So, in times of war, anything that is necessary and proper in order to execute you know what I need to execute to be successful as a commander-in-chief I'm allowed to do it because I as a commander-in-chief that's the you know whatever is necessary and proper in order to win this war I'm allowed to do it Nixon says if you're president it's not illegal and that probably carries on for the governor or the mayor or the sheriff so the draft necessary and proper clause provoked controversy um, Federalists argued that the clause would permit uh, uh, only permit execution of power already granted by the Constitution. So the Federalists were saying that it's the express powers in the Constitution are the ones that, you know, the, the to be able to regulate interstate and make treaties. Now, in order to make a treaty, you're, you're allowed to use whatever means necessary to get to those, you know, powers. To establish a post office, you're allowed to use whatever means necessary, whatever you think is is necessary and proper in order to enforce that. And actually, just that phrase, necessary and proper, all they're talking about is carrying into execution of foregoing power. So, that's, um, actually, I'm allowed to do longer than 15 minutes. I have been sticking with the 15-minute rule um, on this. I, and some of them are 20 minutes, but it, I like 15 minutes. That seems to be a nice little, okay, so, necessary and proper clause. At the time, James Madison concurred with uh, Hamilton arguing in Federalist Number 44 that without this clause, the Constitution would be a dead letter. And there was, there was an argument that was saying that when you had the Articles of Confederation, they were only allowed to use the express powers and they couldn't use any other power. So that really made them, you know, that sort of immobilized them because if, you know, they, uh, if they weren't allowed to, they were only allowed to do what was expressly stated. So if it wasn't expressly stated, then they weren't allowed to get to the thing. So the, what they're trying to say here is necessary and proper clause says that in order to establish an army and navy, you're allowed to do any means necessary in order to establish an army and navy. When you establish a post office, you're allowed to use any means necessary in order to establish the post office. Before, it says you could establish the post office, but how do you do that? How do you establish the post office? By force? You know, that doesn't say you had to do it by force. So, Madison and Hal Hamilton, they said they had to have it in there. The Virginia Ratifying Convention, Patrick Henry, took the opposing view, saying that the clause would lead to limitless federal power, which would inevitably menace individual liberty. So, this is, you know, these are known as the elastic clauses. So, these are the clauses which they can stretch the federal government, uh, the U.S. Constitution, to get as much power as they can. This is Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. Right, so um, supposedly, so Patrick Henry was against it because he thought that it would expand way too much. So the implied powers, the general welfare clause, that is a very huge um, swath of power that you have. The necessary and proper clause, that's a huge swath of power. So between the general welfare and the necessary and proper clause, there is a lot of room to sort of, 
to state what you want to state. And even though that's true, the necessary and proper clause really just says that you, in order to enforce the expressed powers, you can use other powers to get to the end. So it's saying that the means justifies um, the ends, or the, the, the ends justify the means. So you can use whatever means or power, um, whatever means are available in order to get to these ends.